Hello everyone, I'm standing along the American Battlefield Trust interpretive trail here at the White Oak Road Battlefield. You might be able to catch the parking lot over my shoulder over there and maybe while we're shooting you'll be able to catch one of our interpretive signs. Signs that need to be redone. We're aware of that. We can always use help from you all because these things are not inexpensive but we'll get it done one way or another before too long. Now White Oak Road does not sit in the pantheon of Petersburg battles like the crater in Five Forks but it is an important step along the way. But let me even back up a little bit more. Remember that throughout Grant's offenses from June of 1864 all the way into the winter of 1865, he's trying, among other things, to move ever further west, cutting Confederate uh, supply uh, routes, that is roads, and of course railroads, as he moves further on. One of the key advances to that was in, the, uh, in September of 1864 when they gained the line around uh, Fort Welch and whatnot in the Battle of Peebles Farm. And then in February, we visited Hatcher's Run where the Union line is even further um, uh, extended, forcing the Confederates to do the same. That is going to indirectly set up another series of things that you can call the final offensives. And that is, of course, Lewis Farm, White Oak Road, Five Forks, and eventually the breakthrough at Petersburg. So that's where White Oak Road sits for a little bit more detail let's go over to our friend Will Green. Thanks Gary. We are standing behind the Confederate line, the original Confederate works here at White Oak Road. I have to say that uh, I'm particularly proud of this because this came into preservation during the early days of battlefield preservation when I was working with the Association for the Preservation of Civil War Sites. This was one of the first tracts of 22 acres of land that we acquired for purchase back in about 19, I guess about 1990. And for context, you know, Will Green was, is a past president of this organization when it was the APCWS. Well, who could have imagined how successful battlefield preservation would have been thanks to the Civil War Trust and now the American Battlefield Trust. It's a, just a wonderful legacy. But this battlefield, as Gary said, is part of, of Grant's final offensive at Petersburg. It happens on March 31st, 1865. Now Grant starts that final offensive on the 29th. He fights a small battle with the Union 5th Corps, which is moving to the west. That's the real action corps along with Phil Sheridan's cavalry. They fight a small battle at Lewis Farm, several miles to the east of us. March, and that's on March 29th. March 30th is a day of rain. So there's not any combat and there's a very little maneuver. And in fact, the weather is so bad, the roads are so bad, that Grant sends orders to Meade, who passes it along to Warren, commander of the 5th Corps, not to make any advances on March 31st because of the terrible weather. In the meantime, Lee has responded to this final Union offensive by bringing his last reserve division onto the battlefield and that's going to be George Pickett's division. Pickett's division is going to be heading over to the west and eventually fight the Battle of Five Forks the next day. Three brigades from other divisions are moved over here to the earthworks on White Oak Road. And these, there are four brigades engaged in all of this fighting, and they're from three different divisions from three different Confederate corps. This shows you how desperate Lee's situation, how far he's been stretched here. But Lee is thinking offensively. He is setting up a battle plan in which Samuel McGowan's Brigade of South Carolinians will attack the left flank of the advanced Fifth Corps. But before that happens, General Romain Ayers, commander of one of Warren's divisions, shifts forward just a little bit, not in an aggressive way, but just to straighten out his line. That leads the Confederates to believe that they're about to be attacked. And so consequently, in the more, on the morning of March 31st, McGowan and then Stansel's Alabamans and Hutton's Virginians all make an attack in echelon against Ayers' division. Now this is three Confederate brigades versus a three Union brigades and the Confederates, this late in the war, overwhelm and drive Ayers' entire division from the battlefield. They kept going, they kept going. And the next troops they run into are Samuel Crawford's division. And guess what happens? These three Confederate brigades drive Crawford's division off the battlefield. You know, I, I've always thought that when people think that the end of the war is just playing out the string, the Confederates are about ready to give up, there's no morale, by golly, these guys have a lot of fight in them. 
but what they're not, what they don't have is extra troops. And in the afternoon, the one remaining division of Warren's Corps, the division of Charles Griffin, including the brigade of Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, are given orders early in the afternoon to counterattack. That counterattack occurs, it drives the Confederates back all for, over all of the land that they had captured from Crawford and Ayers, back into their position. And what's important is that they get a brigade across the White Oak Road beyond the right flank or the west flank of the Confederate line. That, in effect, cuts off the Confederates here. Now, this is a continuous Confederate line. We're not going to do it, but you can walk into the woods to the west of us along Claiborne Road and see the refused right flank of this 41-mile-long Confederate line. That is literally the end of the Confederate line. It rests on the banks of Hatcher's Run. But now there is a Union Brigade west of that. And that is between the main Confederate body and George Pickett's uh, division at Five Forks. So now Pickett is isolated, and this is going to lead to orders the next day for Warren to move to join Sheridan and fight the decisive battle at Five Forks. That's great, Will. Thank you. And I'm going to ask Doug, this isn't planned at all, but could you follow me real quick? Because I think this, these things never show up as well on camera as we'd like, but this might be worth it. Let's walk. Follow me up here. We'll stay off the works, but come on over here, if you will. There you go. <laughs> let the, it's, let it's, the record show that I'm standing on a log, not on earthworks. <laughs> Thanks, Doug. And so am I now. Uh, if you can go oh, pan over to your left, Doug, without falling off the log there, good job. You can see the moat, okay? So these are these are rifle pits right here. You know, this is a, a basically a Confederate line here, but that's a Redan sticking out there. So what you're seeing off there, I hope, is a moat, okay? And you can see how hard this would have been to attack. In the end, the Yankees don't need to. The Southerners came out to attack them, they pushed them back to the works, and then they interdicted upon the White Oak Road. Now, one more thing. You're seeing it from the outside. Let's close out this video by about facing and walking into the Confederate Redan. One of the things is we're not just securing when we save battlefields, the place where it actually occurred. In some cases, we get structures and we get, in this case, earthworks. So I'll just set Doug free to show whatever he wants to show. So thanks for watching and thanks for your support for preserving places like this.